It was a Friday morning in early 1991 when Arga dipped aboarded a plane from Bali around 9 a.m. destined for Darwin. After a four-hour flight, the plane touched down at Darwin Airport. Arga had left airport in Bali and arrived in Darwin around 1 p.m. local time, adjusting for the central Indonesian time difference. Upon arrival in Darwin, around 2 p.m. local time, Arga went through immigration and customs. He was inspected by a female officer, possibly of Vietnamese descent, who seemed to be an immigrant from Vietnam who had become an Australian citizen. Arga received excellent treatment from the officer, and the process went smoothly. He left the airport without any issues. Next, Arga checked his ATM to confirm if the funds for his expenses had been transferred. Fortunately, the money had been successfully deposited, providing him with a sense of relief. He could now continue his journey as planned, knowing that his finances were in order. After checking his bank account balance, Arga looked for transportation to take him to his accommodation. He decided to stay at a backpacker hostel in Darwin, a budget-friendly option he had chosen before during his travels. The rate at the hostel was around 10 Australian dollars per night, if he remembered correctly. Staying at a backpacker hostel meant sharing a room or dormitory with several other people. The conditions at the hostel were decent, and it was a popular choice for budget-conscious travelers, especially teenagers or those with limited accommodation budgets. Arga settled into his room, which he shared with fellow travelers, including someone from Denmark, if his memory served him right. After settling in, Arga ventured out to explore Darwin City. He noticed the city was relatively quiet, with a smaller population compared to what he was accustomed to in Indonesia. While exploring, Arga came across Indonesian food outlets in places like food courts. Unfortunately, they seemed to be closed at that time. Continuing his exploration, Arga strolled along the beach and admired the cityscape near the coast. Darwin, like Indonesia, had a coastal location, and its climate was similar. The city experienced two seasons, dry and wet, without the presence of autumn or spring. The winter season in southern Australia corresponded to the wet season in Darwin. This meant that during the winter months, Darwin received abundant rainfall, much like the rainy season in areas with two distinct seasons. One notable attraction near Darwin was Darwin Harbour, a bay located in the Northern Territory of Australia. The bay was named after Charles Darwin, the renowned biologist who sailed on the Beagle Expedition, which explored parts of Australia. Darwin Harbour had a tropical monsoon climate with two distinct seasons. The dry season, lasting from April to September, had low rainfall, averaging 24 mm. In contrast, the wet season, occurring from October to March, brought heavy rainfall, with a monthly average of 254 mm, according to the Bureau of Meteorology, 1999. The majority of the rain fell between December and April. The bay boasted a diverse range of fish species, with 415 known varieties. It also provided a habitat for dugongs, which could be observed in their natural environment near Casuarina and Bundilla beaches. Seagrass beds in the bay supported green turtles and other marine species, including commercially valuable shrimp and fish. The bay itself was a submerged river valley, featuring extensive estuarine coastlines and headlands. It experienced macro tides, with a maximum tidal range of 7.8 meters and an average tidal range of 5.5 meters. The tidal currents caused by these tides were strong and complex. In addition to its natural beauty, the bay held historical significance. During World War II in 1942, Darwin was attacked by Japanese planes, resulting in substantial damage to the harbor, ships, wharves, and buildings. Several ships, including the USS Peary and MV Neptuna, were sunk or severely damaged during the attack. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go, go. I hustle, hustle every single day I'll be making moves till I'm buried in my grave uh, To the system, I don't wanna be a slave I've been doing shit my way uh, Or the highway And in the driveway Is a nice range Cause I grind through the climb I invite pain You'll never hear me, bitch Nah, I don't complain Just gotta flip the switch And you can go and obtain Anything you want, anything you need Your mind's got the key
ingredient is belief uh, Better see with the negativity But I just slide right by that energy uh, Even when you feel low, you can still go Even when you feel slow For those interested in visiting Darwin Harbor, there were various activities to enjoy, such as sailing, fishing, diving, or taking guided tours. Darwin Harbor Cruises, in particular, offered a popular option for experiencing the stunning bay while indulging in delicious food and refreshing drinks. You got a mind, but even that could change. You could flip the gray matter like some batter in your brain. That's why to say, fake it till you make it, eh? And if you play that game, then you just might make a change. Rearrange all the bad to okay. Take the worst thoughts and turn them to a game. Take the best thoughts and put them on display. On repeat in your brain till you're feeling no more pain. Uh, never slow yourself down, you can do some more. Push past, start a path. One remarkable feature of Kakadu National Park was the panoramic view from atop the Kakadu Cliffs. Another thrilling experience awaited at the Yellow Water Billabong, where visitors could witness crocodiles and wildlife in their natural habitats, alongside millions of migratory birds who made the park's wetlands their home. Kakadu was not only a spectacular destination but also offered the opportunity to immerse oneself in lush rainforests, rocky gorges, serene swimming holes, and the ancient rock art of the Aboriginal people. With over 5,000 Aboriginal rock art sites, the Bainanj slash Mungui people had called Kakadu home for approximately 65,000 years. They were eager to share their ancient culture and the dramatic seasonal changes in the region. A mere three-hour drive from Darwin, Kakadu National Park beckoned Arga with its rugged and remote natural beauty. Prepare to be captivated by the awe-inspiring vistas that unfold from the majestic Kakadu Cliffs. Embark on a mesmerizing journey as you sail through the enchanting yellow water billabong, where crocodiles and wildlife thrive in their untouched natural habitat. Marvel at the millions of migratory birds that call the park's wetlands home, creating a symphony of life and colors. Kakadu is a destination that goes beyond imagination, allowing you to lose yourself amidst the verdant rainforests, venture into the depths of rocky gorges, and discover serene swimming pools that invite tranquility. Immerse yourself in the world's oldest Aboriginal rock art, with over 5,000 sites scattered throughout the park, each narrating stories of the ancient Bainanj slash Mungui people who have cherished Kakadu as their homeland for an astonishing 65,000 years. Allow them to guide you through their rich cultural heritage and illuminate the significance of the dramatic seasons that shape this remarkable region. Merely a three-hour drive from Darwin, Kakadu National Park eagerly awaits your arrival. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go, 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 go. Hustle out, hustle every single day. I'll be making moves till I'm buried in my grave. To the system, I don't wanna be a slave I've been doing shit my way uh, Or the highway And in the driveway Is a nice However, Argus' time to explore Darwin Harbor and Kakadu National Park was limited After a leisurely stroll along the beach He returned to the backpacker hostel to rest and wait for dinner time For dinner, Arga opted for a meal at a nearby fast food restaurant Later, he ventured out to experience the vibrant nightlife of Darwin with a visit to the Darwin Cinema. The cinema boasted advanced sound systems, although Arga couldn't recall the specific movie he watched. After the screening, he headed back to the comfort of his accommodation at the Backpacker Hostel. Since Arga didn't plan on staying in Darwin for long, the next morning he made his way to the Greyhound bus agency office, carrying his bag. It was around 7 a.m. when he purchased a ticket for the Darwin-Adelaide route, which included stops at Alice Springs and Ayers Rock. The bus ticket cost approximately 260 Australian dollars, comparable to the price of a plane ticket. However, Arga decided against flying as he relished the opportunity to travel through the Australian outback on the Greyhound bus. 
The journey would span three days and three nights, with scheduled sightseeing stops along the way. Most of the fellow passengers were tourists, predominantly from Europe. When asked about their purpose in Australia, many mentioned travel, while some were visiting relatives residing in the country. Arga had always been captivated by the vast and remote landscape of the Australian outback, which covered a significant portion of the continent. Therefore, embarking on the Darwin to Adelaide trip on the Greyhound bus filled him with excitement. The adventure included stops at Catherine, Alice Springs, Ayers Rock, or Uluru, and the Mount Olga Gorge in the Olgas or Kata Juta, a journey that would leave a lasting impression. The bus departed from Darwin in the morning, shortly after 7 a.m., once Arga completed his registration and purchased the bus ticket. Equipped with a backpack and a camera, Arga settled in for the ride. The bus driver proved to be friendly and informative, acting as a guide by providing explanations through the bus's loudspeaker about the various places encountered along the journey. He highlighted the changing landscapes, from lush tropical vegetation in the north to sparse brown shrubs in the south. Moreover, he shared intriguing stories about the history and culture of the locations they passed, including the Adelaide River World War II airstrip, the Mataranka Hot Springs, and the Barrow Creek Aboriginal Art Gallery. The Adelaide River airstrip served as one of the many military sites in the Northern Territory during World War II. Constructed in 1942 as a satellite airstrip for the main base in Bachelor, it played a crucial role in operations against the Japanese, accommodating the Royal Australian Air Force and the United States Army Air Forces. The airstrip boasted two runways, dispersal areas, fuel and ammunition storage facilities, and accommodation camps. Squadrons such as No. 31 RAF, No. 18 Netherlands East Indies, RAF Squadron, No. 380 USAF Bomber Group, and No. 49 USAF Fighter Group operated from Adelaide River. Additionally, the airstrip served as a transit point for aircraft traveling to and from Darwin. Following the war, the airstrip fell into disuse and became mostly overgrown with vegetation. However, remnants of the runways, taxiways, dispersal areas, and camp locations could still be observed from the air or on the ground. The airstrip sat approximately 6 kilometers south of Adelaide River, on the eastern side of Stewart Highway. Stewart Highway, named after John McDowell Stewart, the first European to successfully cross the Australian continent from south to north in 1863, is a major highway that spans approximately 2,720 kilometres from Darwin in the north to Port Augusta in the south. It forms part of Australia's national highway network and traverses the heart of the country's inland region. Along the Stewart Highway, travellers can explore various attractions such as Flinders Ranges, Cooper PD, Wularukata Juta National Park, Alice Springs, Devil's Marbles, Catherine Gorge, and Litchfield National Park. The highway not only serves as a route for exploration but also acts as an emergency landing strip for the Royal Flying Doctor Service, with designated markers along certain sections. The history of Stewart Highway is closely tied to the exploration and development of Australia's central and northern regions. It follows the path of John McDowell Stewart, whose successful expedition from south to north in 1861 to 1862 paved the way for the construction of the Overland Telegraph Line, connecting Australia to the world. Starting as a supply route for the Telegraph Line, the highway later served as a railway line for the old Ghana train from 1929 to 1980. 
During World War II, the highway played a vital role as a supply route for the defense of Darwin and Northern Australia against Japanese attacks. It facilitated the transport of troops, supplies, and equipment, ensuring the region's safety and security. Today, Stewart Highway remains an iconic tourist destination, offering access to breathtaking natural landscapes and cultural wonders. It serves as a lifeline for remote communities and industries in the outback, contributing to the region's connectivity and development. The highway stands as a testament to Australia's resilience and history, inviting travellers to embark on a memorable journey through the vastness and beauty of the Australian outback. Even when you feel low, you can still go. Even when you feel slow, you can still go. Even when there's no hope, you can still go. I never answered a no, man, I still go. Go, 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 go. I hustle hard, hustle every single day I'll be making moves till I'm buried in my grave uh, To the system, I don't wanna be a slave I've been doing shit my way, uh, or the highway And in the driveway, is a nice range Cause I grind through the climb, I invite pain You'll never hear me, bitch, nah, I don't complain Just gotta flip the switch and you can go and obtain Anything you want, anything you need Your mind's got the key ingredient, it's belief uh, They'll deceive with the negativity But I just slide right by that energy uh, Even when you feel low, you can still go Even when you feel slow, you can still go Even when there's no hope, you can still go I never answered a no, man, I still go Go, 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 go But even that could change You could flip the gray matter like some batter in your brain uh, That's why they say Fake it till you make it, eh And if you play that game Then you just might make a change Rearrange all the bad to okay Take the worst stuff saying Turn them to a game Take the best stuff saying Put them on display On repeat in your brain Till you're feeling no more pain uh, Never slow yourself down You can do some more Push past start a pain And you'll find a door Open it up And finally explore Everything that you thought You could never do before uh, And even when you feel low You can still go Even when you feel slow You can still go Even when there's no hope You can still go I never answered a no Man, I still go Go, 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 go However, the Adelaide River airstrip has transformed from an active airport to a serene reminder of its aviation past. Just six kilometers north of the airstrip, on the western side of Stewart Highway, lies the small yet historically significant town of Adelaide River. In 2016, the town had a population of 353 people. During World War II, Adelaide River served as a crucial military base and now boasts several heritage sites, including the Adelaide River War Cemetery, Adelaide River Railway Heritage Precinct, and Adelaide River Inn. Alongside these landmarks, Adelaide River features essential amenities such as a school, police station, health clinic, post office, hotel, and various shops and cafes. Step one, wake up for the gonna rise with the sun. Step two, get some good, some food in you. Step three, Grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four. Everybody just do your thing. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. 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 Yeah. The Mataranka Hot Springs are a magnetic attraction near Catherine in the Northern Territory of Australia. These hot springs emerge from beneath the Earth's surface, where geothermal waters are heated by magma, maintaining a pleasant temperature of approximately 34 degrees Celsius. Enriched with minerals like calcium and magnesium, renowned for their beneficial effects on the skin, these hot springs offer visitors a rejuvenating experience.
Surrounded by lush tropical forests, they serve as a habitat for diverse bird species and other wildlife. A fascinating historical note adds to their allure, as they were once the cherished residents of Jeannie Gunn, a renowned Australian writer who penned the captivating book We of the Never Never. The Mataranka Hot Springs provide an idyllic setting for relaxation, bathing, and communing with the awe-inspiring beauty of nature. Sometimes I'm barely breathing though I always gotta fight and hide from the demons, yo Negative thoughts are poison, they rot uh. Head full of flowers, so here come the clouds uh. They'll never stop unless I can swap The Barrow Creek Aboriginal Art Gallery is a captivating space that showcases the artistic creations and handicrafts crafted by the Aboriginal community residing in and around Barrow Creek, a small town near Catherine in the Northern Territory. Under the guidance of the Barrow Creek Aboriginal Corporation, a non-profit organization dedicated to preserving and promoting Aboriginal culture and heritage, the gallery displays a wide array of art forms, including paintings, sculptures, ceramics, jewelry, and textiles. These masterpieces convey the stories, history, and beliefs of the Aboriginal people, inviting visitors to delve deeper into their rich and diverse cultural tapestry. The gallery fosters artistic growth and community engagement by hosting workshops, exhibitions, and cultural events involving local artists and the wider community. It serves as a gateway to gaining profound insights into the captivating world of Aboriginal art and culture. All the bad for the good in my head when I'm lost. Uh. Yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it Positive thoughts are overtaken I got patience one day at a time It's how you operate a cadence A flow, you grow, you show yourself a foundation Stay away from all the shit that causes temptation I know that I like to do it cause it's sensation I live my life in my head like a narration Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it Wake up, today's gonna be a good day Wake up Today's gonna be a good the bus driver also imparted knowledge about the history and culture of Pine Creek, a historic gold mining town. Nestled approximately 90 kilometers from Catherine in the Northern Territory, Pine Creek proudly wears its title as a gold mining town with a rich legacy. Its origins trace back to 1871, when the first glimmers of gold were discovered in the waters of Pine Creek River. Since then, the town has flourished into a prominent center for gold mining attracting ambitious miners, enterprising traders, and dedicated laborers in pursuit of wealth. Pine Creek played a pivotal role in the construction of the railway line connecting Darwin and Adelaide, facilitating the movement of goods and passengers across various towns. Today, Pine Creek entices visitors with a host of intriguing attractions. The Pine Creek National Gold Mining Museum presents a remarkable collection of mining tools, photographs, and historical artifacts, offering a glimpse into the town's illustrious gold mining industry. Additionally, the breathtaking Umbrawarad Gorge National Park beckons with its stunning natural beauty, featuring striking red cliffs, crystal clear rivers, and enchanting eucalyptus forests visitors can indulge in hiking, camping, or immersing themselves in the refreshing pools of cascading waterfalls. Pine Creek also boasts essential facilities such as schools, churches, shops, and accommodations, providing an immersive experience for those eager to delve into the captivating history and culture of gold mining in Australia. As the tale unfolds, we delve into the legendary Newcastle Waters Cattle Station, an expansive realm nestled within the Barclay region of the Northern Territory. This sprawling estate spans approximately 1,033,101 hectares and boasts the capacity to house a remarkable 65,700 cattle, including a herd of 20,000 majestic Brahmin breeding cows. The station's terrain encompasses a captivating mosaic of landscapes, from vast open plains that stretch into the horizon to fertile flood areas teeming with life, and even enchanting forested sandhills that whisper tales of ancient wisdom. In the early 1880s, the visionary Dr. W. J. Brown, hailing from Adelaide, laid the foundation of this agricultural marvel, coincidentally establishing the Springvale Cattle Station near Catherine as well. Tales of its grandeur spread far and wide, even reaching the ears of Carrie Packer, the illustrious Australian media tycoon, 
who entrusted his son James with a transformative year of toil on these hallowed grounds. Today, the station stands proudly under the stewardship of the Consolidated Pastoral Company CPC, a veritable titan in the Australian cattle industry. Yet, destiny has something truly extraordinary in store for this cherished expanse of land. Sun Cable, a visionary renewable energy company, has chosen Newcastle Waters to house the world's largest solar farm, an awe-inspiring testament to mankind's quest for sustainable energy. Through an underwater cable, this power plant of the future will illuminate the bustling city-state of Singapore, bridging nations and forging a path towards a greener world. Newcastle Waters, with its unique blend of pastoral and technological prowess, emerges as an unrivaled beacon of hope, embodying the limitless potential of both the livestock and energy industries in Australia. Living life, every day, late at night, not okay, all I want and I pray, all I need are some better days. Fuck me, I'm looking in the mirror, so foggy, but I've never seen clearer. I don't really think anyone can save me, and honestly, I'm not really sure I want saving. I like to be my own worst enemy. There's no risk if you don't try at anything, so I'ma just get by in everything. See you in the next life, have to be a better me. I don't think that my head's on straight, gotta flip it and grip it and go and get an x-ray. What's wrong with me? I just feel way, pushing on my chest and it squeeze till I suffocate. Better change my mindset, meditate. It's pretty cool that I'm alive and have better days. I could walk, see, here, I should celebrate, think I could change. My mind maybe elevate Living life every day, late at night, not okay. All I want and I pray, all I need are some better days. Yeah, all I need are some better days. Cause all I want and I pray, I believe in the better yeah. days. I'm kinda stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I work hard or live in my pace? You're only young once, yeah, that's all great. But I also want a future where I'm okay. Living life is doing lots of cocaine. Wait, no, it's living with no shame. Wait, no, it's sleeping in on Sundays. I guess it's different for each of us and that's okay. Well, I just wanna be happy. How to get there? Hmm, glad that you asked me. I think it's different for everyone Some of us need work, others need fun Some of us need purpose to overcome But try to do what you love when it's said and done Cause there's so many differences in each of us Trust your gut, it can show you what you want Living life, every day, late at night Not okay, all I want, and I pray All I need, are some better days Yeah Turning our attention to the Tennant Creek Aboriginal community We step into a tapestry Woven with the vibrant hues of diversity and cultural heritage Nestled amidst the captivating landscape surrounding the town of Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory, this community serves as a vibrant melting pot for various Aboriginal groups. Among them, the Warramunga people emerge as an influential force, their spirits deeply intertwined with the land and waters that have cradled their existence throughout time immemorial. As the original custodians of this ancient land, the Warramunga have weathered the storm of colonization, persevered through the trials of missions, and embraced their identity amidst the relentless waves of assimilation policies. Alongside the Warramungu, the Tennant Creek Aboriginal community embraces the richness of other groups such as the Walpiri, Kaiditch, and Aliawar, who have either migrated from neighboring regions or flocked to the town in pursuit of employment, education, or healthcare. Their collective spirit breathes life into a myriad of cultural activities and organizations, each pulsating with the vibrant heartbeat of their traditions and heritage. The Annie and Ginny Eye Health Aboriginal Corporation stands tall as a pillar of holistic healthcare, nurturing the physical and spiritual well-being of the Aboriginal communities in the Barclay region. Meanwhile, the Nyinka Nyinyu Art and Culture Center, a tapestry of creative expression, unfolds the narrative of Warramungu art and culture through its captivating museum exhibits, evocative galleries, and immersive cultural tours. The calendar dances to the rhythm of celebration, as a multitude of events and festivals, such as the Desert Harmony Festival, the Barclay Regional Arts Showcase, and NADOC Week, come alive, showcasing the kaleidoscope of Aboriginal culture that thrives within Tennant Creek's vibrant heart. This dynamic and ever-evolving community stands tall, resilient in preserving their traditions while adapting to the winds of change that sweep across the ages. They tell me that I'm never gonna make it They want me to do something that can make sense They hate when I keep dreaming I'll be famous but I 
I got all this potential, it's deep inside of me But they hate when you're successful cause they try to be They sit there being just mental because you're trying things And they just want you to settle and do the right thing So get a good job, don't slack off Wake up every morning, make a good impression on your boss Don't do anything that I wouldn't do And when you're making money, make sure you don't spend it too soon <laughs> Fuck that, I'll do what I wanna do I got a different path from everyone and that includes you who are you to tell me how to live life? In these times, it feels like nobody's right, yeah So I'ma figure out what else we succeed And then invest all of my time into that and proceed uh, I need whatever the hell could make me happy And I don't think you have a clue what could that be They tell me that I'm never gonna make it They want me to do something that can make sense They hate when I keep dreaming I'll be famous Arga arrived in Catherine around noon and had a few hours to explore the town Catherine was named after the second daughter of James Chambers ESQ, a pastoralist who supported the explorer John McDowell Stewart. Stewart crossed the Catherine River in 1862 during his journey traversing the continent from north to south. The town is located in the Northern Territory, a federal territory of Australia in the central northern part of the country. Tell me that I'm never gonna make it They want me to do something that can make sense decided to visit Nitmaluk National Park, where he witnessed the beauty of Catherine Gorge. This series of gorges was formed by the Catherine River, and the scenery was truly remarkable. Arga embarked on a river exploration by boat, marveling at the cliffs, waterfalls, and wildlife. He also learned about the Jawoin people, the traditional owners of this land. Before entering Catherine, it seemed that a young man in the uniform of the Royal Australian Air Force, RAAF, alighted from the bus. Apparently, he did not intend to undertake the long journey that Arga was on. After Catherine, Arga remembered that there were passengers who boarded the bus, and it seemed that their seats were reserved, perhaps they had made reservations in advance. They were an aboriginal couple with two children. The rest of the bus passengers were those who embarked together from Darwin in the morning. Arga left Catherine in the late afternoon and continued his journey towards Alice Springs. It was a long journey across the desert, and for hours, Arga could only see red sand and blue skies. The driver mentioned that Alice Springs is the heart of the outback and serves as a hub for tourism, mining, and agriculture. He also shared that Alice Springs is home to many Aboriginal people, who have a rich and diverse culture. Arga arrived in Alice Springs around midnight and he was surprised to see how dark and quiet the place was. The only lights came from the bus terminal and a few hotels nearby. Arga checked into a simple motel and quickly fell asleep, excited to continue his journey the next day. In the morning, Arga and the other bus passengers enjoyed breakfast at a restaurant located in a shopping complex mall in Alice Springs. One famous tourist attraction here is the Alice Springs Desert Park, which is an environmental education facility and wildlife park in the Northern Territory of Australia. 
The park is situated on a 1,300 hectare land, with a core area of 52 hectares. It is an institutional member of the Zoo and Aquarium Association and Botanic Gardens Conservation International. The park features native animals and plants that represent the desert environment of Central Australia and contributes to their conservation through research programs and public education. The park offers visitors the opportunity to experience a variety of deserts in Central Australia and explore the relationships between plants, animals, and humans. This area is culturally significant to the local Arun people. Many park employees work under the supervision of decision makers and their guardians, the people formerly known as traditional owners of the park. The park has three different desert habitat areas accessible through a 1.6-kilometer trail, desert rivers, sand country, and woodland. Additionally, the park has a nocturnal house and an outdoor theater. The entrance area includes an exhibition center, restrooms, and cafes. Some examples of animals and plants that can be found in the park are Desert rivers, and this habitat, visitors walk through dry riverbeds, areas that have been flooded, and past wetlands and waterholes. The plants here include river red gum trees, culiba trees, water plants, and reeds. Animals in this habitat include finches, cockatoos, water birds, frogs, and fish. Demonstrations here show how Aboriginal people used this habitat to harvest food and medicine. Sand Country This exhibition is a recreation of sandy desert landscapes, including clay, gypsum, and salt pans. Nocturnal House. The Nocturnal House is located between the sand country and woodland habitats, and it is home to many reptiles, invertebrates, birds, and mammals of Central Australia that are active during the night. The collection includes some reptiles that may be active during the day but are difficult to find in the desert. Woodland. The woodland habitat includes enclosures for kangaroos and emus. Visitors can walk among the kangaroos in their exhibition area. A description of Alice Springs Desert Park can be written as follows. Alice Springs Desert Park is an amazing place to learn about life in the Central Australian Desert. Here, you can see a wide variety of animals and plants that have adapted to the dry and harsh environment. You can also hear stories from Aboriginal people who have lived in this area for thousands of years. Explore three different desert habitats, desert rivers, sand country, and woodland. Visit the nocturnal house to see extraordinary creatures of the night. Enjoy free-flying bird shows in the outdoor theater. Alice Springs Desert Park is a must-visit experience when exploring the Northern Territory of Australia, a place to see kangaroos, wallabies, and other native animals. Additionally, there is the Museum of Central Australia, which showcases the history and culture of the region. The Museum of Central Australia is a museum located in the Araluan Cultural Precinct in Alice Springs. The museum tells the unique natural history story of this region, tracing the development of its landscapes and the fascinating creatures that inhabit it. The museum also houses the Strello Research Center, one of the most important collections of films, sounds, archives, and museum objects in Australia related to the life and ceremonies of indigenous people. At the Museum of Central Australia, you can see various exhibitions, including meteorite fragments, fossils, displays of creatures you might encounter in the region, including old birds, old mammals, old reptiles, O oh, insects. The museum is open from Tuesday to Friday, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Admission is free for Northern Territory residents and costs $8 for adults, $6 for children slash concession, and $20 for a family, two adults, three children. 
Next, Arga and the other passengers board the bus again and head to Ayers Rock, also known as Uluru by the local Anangu people. It is a four-hour journey across the desert, and for hours all I could see was red sand and the endless blue sky. The driver informs the passengers that Uluru is a sacred site for the Anangu people and that the passengers must respect their beliefs and customs when visiting it. Upon arriving at Uluru around 2 o'clock in the afternoon, Arga was immediately captivated by its awe-inspiring beauty. The magnificent sandstone monolith stood tall at a height of 500 meters, majestically overlooking the flat plains and exhibiting a mesmerizing color palette that transformed with the sun's movements. Eager to explore this natural wonder, Arga joined a guided walking tour around the base of Uluru, where he encountered ancient rock paintings, caves, waterholes, and an array of plants utilized by the Ananga people for sustenance and medicine. It was during this immersive experience that Arga delved into the rich tapestry of stories and legends, unraveling the origins of Uluru and its profound significance to the Anangu. The Anangu people hold deep reverence for Uluru, considering it a sacred hill that epitomizes their deep connection with the land, ancestors, and spiritual traditions. While Uluru presents a challenge for tourists, it holds an even more profound meaning for the Anangu. According to their belief, the world initially existed without form or attributes until ancestral beings emerged from the void and traversed the land, giving shape to all living creatures and establishing the diverse ecosystem. Uluru stands as a tangible testament to the accomplishments of these ancestral beings throughout the creation period. Enshrined within Uluru lie ancient sacred stories, passed down orally as an invaluable heritage. While some stories remain too sacred to be shared with outsiders, a few tales have been revealed. These include the story of Lunkata, a cunning blue-tongued lizard ancestor who journeyed from the north to Uluru and cunningly stole meat from the emu. When the emu pursued Lunkata back to his cave, he callously abandoned her, resulting in the emu igniting a blazing fire that consumed the entire cavern, causing Lunkata to plummet in his escape. Another tale recounts the plight of the Mala, a group of wild rabbits who partook in an initiation ceremony at Uluru. As they danced, sang, and adorned the rock walls with their paintings, their peaceful celebration was disrupted by Kirpani, an immense snake that unleashed fire upon them. While some Mala managed to evade the flames, others were tragically ensnared. The story of Kaniya and Liru recounts the ancestral struggle between a python and a venomous snake at Uluru. Kaniya embarked on a quest to find her grandchild, who had been slain by Liru. Discovering Liru on the eastern side of the rock, Kaniya launched an attack with her tail, while Liru defended himself with his poisonous fangs. The marks left by their ferocious battle can still be observed on the surface of Uluru. For the Ananga people, Uluru is a poignant symbol of their identity and heritage. They assume the responsibility of preserving and safeguarding Uluru as an embodiment of their cultural legacy. In October 2019, the climbing route on Uluru was closed, allowing the traditional custodians to finally share their history and sacred narratives with visitors. Protecting and preserving Uluru is a formidable undertaking, considering its vulnerability to climate change, fires, invasive species, and human activities. To ensure the safeguarding of Uluru, the following measures can be taken. Demonstrating respect for Uluru's cultural and spiritual value to the Ananga people by refraining from climbing, damaging, or polluting the site. Complying with the regulations and guidelines established by the National Park Authority and traditional custodians is paramount. Supporting conservation and restoration endeavors pursued by the Australian government, Ananga people, and relevant organizations dedicated to preserving biodiversity, mitigating the effects of climate change, and enhancing the well-being of local communities. Adopting responsible and sustainable tourism practices by selecting tour operators that prioritize principles of ecotourism, minimize carbon footprint, properly manage waste, and ensure minimal disruption to the wildlife and plants at Uluru. Engaging in a deeper understanding of Uluru's history, culture, and natural significance by actively listening to the stories and knowledge shared by the Ananga people and experienced tour guides. Appreciating the beauty and uniqueness of Uluru as a UNESCO World Heritage Site is essential. Participating in educational programs, research initiatives, or volunteer opportunities associated with Uluru by joining organizations or institutions that provide avenues for learning and contributing to the preservation of Uluru. Spreading awareness and garnering support for Uluru by sharing personal experiences and information about Uluru with friends, family, and on social media platforms.
Supporting campaigns and initiatives that emphasize the significance of preserving and protecting Uluru is crucial. Uluru is the setting for several festivals and ceremonies, including Tjunga Ceremony, which translates to Together in the Ananga language, is an annual cultural festival showcasing art, music, film, food, and sports from the Ananga people and other Aboriginal communities in Australia. Held in April around Uluru, the ceremony aims to celebrate and promote the richness and diversity of Aboriginal culture. Inma ceremony, meaning dance in the Ananga language, is a sacred ritual performed by the Ananga people to welcome the arrival of a new season, commemorate significant events, or seek blessings from their ancestors. It involves singing, dancing, and body painting that depicts sacred stories connected to Uluru. The ceremony adheres to specific timing aligned with the natural cycles. Ngankari ceremony, which signifies healing in the Ananga language, entails traditional healing practices employed by the Ananga people to address physical and mental ailments. The ceremony incorporates massage, natural remedies, and energy transfers from healers' hands to patients' bodies. It aims to restore harmony between the body, mind, and spirit. In addition to these ceremonies, various celebrations and festivals related to Allura take place, such as the Desert Mob Art Festival, Flickerfest Film Festival, Tastes of Central Australia Food Festival, and more. While climbing Uluru has been prohibited since 2019, numerous other tourist activities are available in the vicinity. One remarkable experience involves dining under the starry sky, providing a romantic and breathtaking encounter with Uluru's magnificence. Guests can savor delectable meals while basking in the enchanting views of Uluru and the sparkling night sky. Dining packages like Sounds of Silence, Tali Wero, and A Night at Field of Light offer unique and unforgettable experiences. The next day, Arga visited another remarkable formation called Mount Olga Gorge, or known as Tata Chuta by the Anangu people. It is a group of 36 dome-shaped rocks that are taller and wider than Uluru. He hiked through one of the canyons, where Arga saw waterfalls, pools, and wildlife. The driver informed the passengers that Kata Chuta is also considered sacred by the Anangu and that some parts are off-limits to visitors. Kata Chuta is located approximately 25 kilometers from Uluru. Arga spent the morning exploring Kata Chuta. He walked around the base of the domes. Arga and his entourage left Katachuda at noon and continued on to Adelaide via Earl Dunda. But before going to Earl Dunda Arga stopped first at Noel Fullerton's Camel Farm. From Katachuda or Mount Olga Gorge to Noel Fullerton's Camel Farm about 40 minutes for a distance of 50 kilometers. Then from Noel Fullerton's Camel Farm to Earl Dunda, approximate 2 hours for 200 kilometers. Noel Fullerton's Camel Farm is a tourist attraction located north of Alice Springs, Northern Territory. Alice Springs is a city in the Northern Territory of Australia. The city is located in the center of the Australian continent, roughly equidistant from Darwin to the north and Adelaide to the south. Alice Springs is on the banks of the Fickle Todd River and Stewart Thoroughfare. The town is in the traditional territory of the Arunt people, who call it Mpantui. Noel Fullerton's Camel Farm was the first camel farm established in Central Australia in the early 1980s by Noel Fullerton, a camel legend in the region. This place offers a variety of activities related to camels, such as riding a camel, learning about the history and culture of camels in Australia, and seeing a collection of antique items related to camels. 
Earl Dunda, a pastoral area operating as a cattle station about 200 kilometers south of Alice Springs in Australia's Northern Territory. Earl Dunda has an area of about 3,108 square kilometers and has a population of around 6,500 head of cattle from the Santa Gertrudis race in 2010. Earl Dunda is located at the intersection of the Stewart Highway and Lassiter Highway, making it a strategic place for travelers who want to visit Uluru, Kadet Chuda, Kings Canyon, or Alice Springs. In Earl Dunda, one can find facilities such as the Earl Dunda Roadhouse, a resort that offers country-style accommodation, home cooking, and other facilities. Can enjoy the beautiful natural scenery of the Red Desert, acacia trees, and rivers wild. Earl Dunda is also the place where the native Anenga native rights were recognized by a federal court in April 2023. This native right gives the Anengu the right to hunt and perform ceremonies on the land, as well as to be consulted about its use. There are several things to do in Earl Dunda, such as Stay at Earl Dunda Roadhouse, a resort offering country-style accommodation, home cooking and other amenities. Here you can also get tourist information, rent a car, or order bus tickets. Taking a candid photo shoot in Australia, a photography tour that offers the services of a professional photographer to capture your moments in Earl Dunda and its surroundings. You can choose the location, theme, and style to your liking. After that, travel from Earl Dunda via Kuldura in the evening. The bus passes Kuldura Police Station while continuing its journey towards Kuber PD. Next Arga entered Kuber PD which is about 846 kilometers from the city of Adelaide and 500 kilometers south of Kuldura Roadhouse. Kuber PD is a town in South Australia which is known as the opal capital of the world because of the large amount of opal that is mined there. The city is located in a very hot desert area, so many of the residents live underground in houses called dugouts. The name Kuber PD comes from the Aboriginal language Kupa Pidi, meaning white man's hole. The town was founded in 1915, when Opal was first discovered by Will Hutchison. The city also has several points of interest such as Big Winch 360, a circular cinema showcasing the city's history and culture, the Muna Opal Mine and Museum, an opal mine and museum featuring a collection of precious stones, and Big Winch 360 Lookout, a place to see the view of the city from a height. Another tourist object is Lake Eyre. Located about 700 kilometers north of Adelaide. Lake Eyre is the largest salt lake in Australia, with an area of around 9,500 square kilometers. Usually dry, but sometimes filled with water due to seasonal flooding. It is located approximately 700 kilometers north of Adelaide and 1,000 kilometers south of Kuldura Roadhouse. Next is Glendambo which is located about 593 kilometers north of Adelaide. The history of Glendambo is not well documented, but some information comes from various sources. Glendambo is a city and location in the state of South Australia, located on the Stewart Highway about 592 kilometers from Adelaide and 254 kilometers from Cooper PD. The town was founded on May 13, 1982 and originates from Glendambo Homestead, which was founded in the 1960s by the Denton family. The town's name means Eagle Pool in the local Aboriginal language. 
Glendambo is the only service center between Pimba and Kuber PD and offers two high street restaurants, as well as a Glendambo hotel slash motel. Glendambo also has direct access to the Air Peninsula via the unpaved Wirola Road via the scenic Gollar chain. Glendambo is a popular stopover for travelers on the Stewart Highway, as well as a base for exploring nearby Lake Eyre National Park and Wabma Kadarba Mount Springs Conservation Park. Glendambo has a population of about 30 individuals and an annual rainfall of only 160 mm. The climate is dry, with hot summers and cold winters. Average temperatures range from 6 degrees Celsius in July to 30 degrees Celsius in January. The city has a school, police station, health clinic, post office and community hall. Next is Woomera which is located about 446 kilometers north of Adelaide. Woomera, Rocket Testing Area. The distance from Adelaide to Kuber PD is about 849 kilometers by road. It takes approximately 9 hours and 9 minutes to drive from Adelaide to Kuber PD. Yes, from Glendambo to Port Augusta it will pass through Woomera. You can take the Stewart Highway, A87, route from Glendambo to Port Augusta. The travel time is about 3 hours and 55 minutes and the distance is about 419 kilometers. The road is paved and passes several rest and gas stations along the route, such as Pimba, Roxby Downs and Iron Knob. Woomera is a town located about 180 kilometers north of Port Augusta. The city is known as Australia's nuclear weapons and rocket testing center in the 1940s to 1980s. Here you can visit the Woomera Heritage Center, a museum displaying artifacts, photos, and videos related to the history of Woomera and Australia's space program. So if you are interested in military and space history, you can stop at Woomera to have a look. Port Augusta is located about 310 kilometers north of Adelaide and is the last object before reaching Adelaide. Port Augusta is the gateway to the Flinders Mountain Range, a mountain range offering scenic views, hiking trails and aboriginal rock art. It is also a major transportation hub and center for renewable energy projects. It is located approximately 300 kilometers north of Adelaide and 1050 kilometers south of Cultura Roadhouse. The distance from Adelaide to Port Augusta is approximately 308 kilometers by road. It takes about 3 hours 30 minutes to drive from Adelaide to Port Augusta. There are many things you can do in Port Augusta, such as Visit the Australian Arid Lands Botanic Garden, a botanical garden featuring plants native to dry climates. Here you can stroll among the beautiful scenery, see more than 150 species of birds and sample specialties in the cafe. Explore the Wadlata Outback Center, an information and attraction center that invites you to find out more about history and life in the outback. Here you can enter the Tunnel of Time, an interactive installation that tells the story of Outback's journey from prehistoric times to the present. Stroll around town and see historic buildings such as the Port Augusta Town Hall, a town hall building built in 1886-87 in a Victorian architectural style. Climb aboard the Water Tower Lookout, a water tower built in 1882 and offering views of the city and bay from a height of 32 meters. Take a train on the Peachy Ritchie Railway, a historic railroad linking Port Augusta with Corn. Here you can feel the sensation of riding a classic steam or diesel train while enjoying the views of the Flinders Ranges Mountains. Visit Royal Flying Doctor Tours, a tour that gives you the opportunity to get up close and personal with the operations of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, an organization that provides medical services to Outback residents. Here you can see the planes, simulators and medical equipment used by flying doctors. Swim with the giant cuttlefish, a species of giant squid that congregate in the waters near Wyala, about 80 kilometers south of Port Augusta. Every winter, thousands of these squid come here to breed, and you can dive or snorkel to see their spectacular colors. Arga arrived in Adelaide on the fourth day, just before evening. 
He thanked the driver for the excellent service and said goodbye to his fellow passengers. Arga enjoys being with them and conversing with them during this long journey. Then Arga checks in at the comfortable backpacker in Adelaide and relaxes in the room which is the dormitory. Arga looks back at the photos and memories of this incredible trip. In the dormitory room there is a tall young man, an American Marine who is on holiday, a boy from Canada, and two girls from England. The two British girls saw Arga's photos and one of them who was a bit quieter liked it. Arga has seen some of the most beautiful and unique places in Australia, and he is grateful for this opportunity. Arga had traveled from Darwin to Adelaide on a Greyhound bus, and it was an adventure he will always remember. Then Arga stayed at the backpacker in Adelaide for several nights. Shared a room with two British girls, an American Marine and a young Canadian.